Welcome to Kingdom Life Church and today's message with Drs. Dennis and Jennifer Clark brought to you by Full Stature Ministries and its dedicated supporters. We are here to equip you with the how-to tools and practical effective ways for empowering your Christian journey. Join us as we explore teachings that bring healing through forgiveness and ignite transformation in both individuals and families. For more resources, join our mission. Visit us at forgive123.com. Let's embark on this journey together. Welcome, Kingdom Life Church Full Stature Ministries. You know, we were known as Full Stature Ministry for many, 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 many years before we planted this little church in Fort Mill. So most people know us as Full Stature Ministries, but we have Kingdom Life Church as well. So it's both. If you'd like to contribute to both, you may contribute to both. We won't stop you. Uh, uh, no gift is too small. Um, uh, but the, the thing I want to challenge for the rest of August on the Peace Challenge is what uh, we we're looking for a term for it, for people that were really drawn near to God and deepening their relationship with God. Uh, we call it dual awareness, something that can be learned. Uh, Stephen, come on up. I want to use uh, someone as an example of what it's like. <clears throat> if you could stand over here. All right, this is Stephen. He's a superhero, spiritually anointed man of God. And if not, he will be before he leaves. Uh, uh, put your hand right here. This is your spirit. That's the door of the heart. That's where your, your spirit is. And what we, we're challenging people is to stay in peace from here regardless of what's going on circumstantially and regardless of what's going on in your head. All right? So just to show you that it's possible, because how many know you can chew gum and walk at the same time? How many know that? Uh, uh, you'd be so impressed with the abilities that you could use when you use the proper uh, 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 organ to accomplish the purpose. But right here, you feel the peace of God? Yeah. He could feel the peace of God, and he could answer my question from his head at the same time. That's dual awareness. We want you to be challenged for the rest of August to walk in the supernatural peace of God from down here. Be aware of this, regardless of what your thoughts are, regardless whether you're at work and you're busy uh, concentrating on something. You can do both but it needs to be practiced because otherwise you'll just stay up here. All right? So you can do both. You've got to be convinced you can do both before you'll even practice it. But uh, you don't make decisions without having peace first. So you'd have to be aware of your spirit man down here, the innermost being, the hidden man of the heart, the bowels, the gut, the belly. This is the door. All right, you did good. You got an A+. Plus. <laughs> All right. This morning's message, we're, we're still in the peace challenge, but I've, I've just got to do it. I can't wait any longer. There's going to be a joy challenge coming up in September. And so I figure before we challenge you with it, we probably ought to explain what it is. And uh, <laughs> otherwise, we're going, I don't know. I don't know what it is. But we're going to, today's message is really uh, enjoying how to enjoy God. How to enjoy God through the Spirit. How do I enjoy God? Um, and listen to this. This is in the scripture, so ask yourself, what do I do with that? Listen to this. In the Amplified Bible, it said, <clears throat> as the deer pants for. But as the deer pants for the water, so my soul longeth after thee. Okay? It's going to be eating and drinking, but from a spiritual context. That's the way God made us. Taste and see that the Lord is good. Taste is actually can be translated discern, distinguish, differentiate. You know, like flavors. You know, this is chocolate, this is vanilla. This is, you, you make a distinction. But taste and see that the Lord is good. But listen, listen to this. this is my favorite word. I, I've never wrote this down when I was a baby Christian, and it's probably in every Bible I've got, I have it written in the front somewhere, the makarios. That's a Greek word for a life 
joy that is enviable. A life joy. Life joy. Spiritual life joy. Not happy like the world would do. That depends on circumstances. Life joy depends on God. A life joy. Now, the Amplified pulls out that word makarios. Uh, uh, most translations say blessed. That's really downplaying it. Blessed. I mean, unsaved people say, be blessed, I'm blessed, I'm blessed. <laughs> Which might mean they're getting their way today, so they're blessed. <laughs> um, but listen, here's blessed in the Amplified Bible, expanding on that word makarios. By the way, the, the, the footnote that I read many, many years ago about Makarios was this is what the heathens had in the balcony watching Christians being fed to the lions. They said those people, I wouldn't want to trade places with them, but those people have a Makarios. They have a life joy that's enviable. Now, they certainly didn't envy their position and they wouldn't have traded with them for the world. These people are going to be devoured, slain. And yet, I think that's even where the old-time pictures where the halos came from. There was a glory, there was a countenance, there was a, a beauty on them that even unsaved people couldn't put their finger on it. They said it was a life joy that was enviable. Well, if it's enviable, that means the onlookers and say, I wish I had what they have. They've got something, I don't know what it is. Now, here, here it is in the Amplify. Blessed happy, blithesome, joyous, spiritually prosperous with life, joy, and satisfaction in God's favor and salvation, regardless of outward circumstances, are the meek, the mild, the pleasant, the long-suffering, for they shall inherit the earth. Sound a little bit like they were excited. With life in God, a life joy. Blessed and fortunate and happy and spiritually prosperous, in that state in which the born-again child of God enjoys his favor and salvation are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, uprightness, and right standing with God, for they shall be completely satisfied. And uh, blessed, happy to be envied, and spiritually prosperous, with life, joy, and satisfaction in God's favor and salvation, regardless of their outward conditions, are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. Do you think there, there's, there's something more than happy? Happy would depend on circumstances. This is, in every verse in the Beatitudes, it says, regardless of outward circumstances. That would be like the ones that were, Paul wrote Philippians, the joy book, in prison. So it wasn't his circumstances that he was so uh, enjoying as much as it was his God. And there is a challenge for the kingdom people to know Righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Ghost. And actually, that's love, joy, peace. Righteousness is love and action. So the kingdom of God, the realm of which the Christian is supposed to be living in, is love, joy, peace. And there's a challenge in that. Because it's easier to be religious and just do this and do that and don't do this and don't do that. And uh, But God's going to get us to the point to where, and I think a good place to start is, like we said, start with dual awareness. Start practicing what your gut's saying. It, you can still think. You can still use your head. You can't chew gum. You can walk at the same time. But you learn dual awareness means activate both of them and be conscious of both of them and increase that consciousness to where that awareness increases in your life. To the degree that it increases, you will also see peace increase, joy increase. And, and the ability to sense the promptings of God. Now, <clears throat> I always like the uh, Acts 17, 27, where it says, uh, it's talking about that God has appointed the exact time and the exact place in which you should live. So he put it, all the people on the face of the earth, that he has appointed an exact time and an exact place in which they should live. But, <clears throat> but the next verse says that they would seek God if perhaps they might feel around for him, and we're going to get into that, feel around for him and find him, though he's not far from any of us. So there's a way of pursuing and finding God, even though he's not far away from us, it has to be done properly. And that's really what I want to preach this morning, because I think this is uh, extremely important. 
So we're going to start by what the Bible says. We can taste and enjoy God. Um, taste and see that the Lord is good. And as a deer pants for the water, so my soul longeth after thee. Uh, the Bible says we can taste and enjoy God. See, we're not used to that kind of language. But in reality, uh, it's a spiritual perception that if, if it's left untapped and untouched, it becomes dormant and not usable. And people are, are we're going we're gonna to learn how to approach it in, in a tangible way this morning. Uh, the, the Bible says we can taste and enjoy God. He didn't only come near to us. He's given himself for us. All through scriptures, Old Testament, New Testament, God expected to build a relationship with you. Your word was found and I did eat and it was unto me the joy and the rejoicing of my heart. God's saying, taste and see that the Lord is good. Discern, distinguish, learn the various flavors. Do you know the difference between when you have peace and when you have joy? That's two different flavors. You need to know that there's a distinction. And <clears throat> to distinguish or differentiate is what it means when it says taste, taste. Your words were found and I did eat them and they were unto me the joy and the rejoicing of my heart. I just love that because it should, it should be experienced not in the mind, but everything I'm saying should be taking place in your spirit. That should be a no-so down here, not just a no-so here. This should agree, but this should inform this, that this is so. You, in other words, the word we've been coming up with in, in uh, some of our prayer meetings, some of our intercession, the important word is substance. How many of you know that scripture? Faith is the substance of things hoped for. And I'm saying that the problem is, is that we need to know that substance has to be substantiated. All right? Faith is not something you just tack on to your uh, lack of knowing what to do. Well, I'll just do it by faith, which means I have no idea what I'm doing. Because faith is substance, and you can't substantiate that you have a no-so. When you have a no-so, you substantiate the substance. And that's, that's really what I feel the, the burden of the Lord is for this church right now, to challenge the people to substantiate what you know instead of just thinking in your head. All right? So we look, and, and, and uh, Jesus himself says that he is our food. Does he not? I am the bread of life. Your fathers ate the manna that came down from heaven, but I am the bread of life. And he says, he that comes to me shall... Never hunger. He who believes in me shall never thirst. Hungering and thirsting is going to have to be substantiated. It's substance. This is not poetry and meaningless words. God wants you to enter into that realm and be aware of it in your spirit. Spiritual awareness is to substantiate all of these things you know in your head need to be experienced. Intimacy needs to be experienced not learned about. So food is enjoyment. When, when we, we eat our meals, the food we eat enters into us and becomes part of us, does it not? In the natural. This is what Jesus says. When you feed upon the word, and that word has specificity, it has flavors, and it has uh, nuances, characteristics of God himself, it says then it should become part of us. As it becomes part of us, then we can express it. And we're to be expressions of God. But that expression of God needs to be that which we have tasted and seen that the Lord is good. That has been part of us. We're using the word uh, out of the message for, as a constant reminder of the spiritual process. God builds according to a pattern based on a principle. And in uh, the message translation, it says, steep yourself. Jennifer and I like to use the word marinate. Steep, like you would steep a tea bag in, in a teapot, but steep yourself in Here's the progression. God reality. God initiative. God provision. What's missing very often is we pray our own ideas. We pray what we want. We pray we just whatever we come up with in our head. But in, in reality, what God's looking for is if I can get you to marinate in my reality, and allow my initiative. What, what do I mean by initiative? It means 
the prompt, feeling led by the Spirit, not by your carnal emotions, being led or prompted by the Spirit, the Spirit bear witness. That initiation is extremely important because then it's not you trying to do something for God as much as God's trying to work through you. And it is God who is at work in you to both will and to perform. And guess what happens then? Anything you ask shall be accomplished for you. Do you ever wonder about that scripture? Ask in my name and it shall be given to you. Well, asking in my name, my nature, my reality, then the initiative will come from God and God will never initiate something that he won't provide for. If you, you ask and you don't receive because you ask amiss, that you consume it upon your lust. You took the initiative. You didn't know how to recognize the prompting from the spirit and you just had your, good, your own ideas. You start with your own ideas and it, it'll fall flat. Now, this food says you'll never eat, uh, you'll never hunger or thirst. I'm the bread of life. There's clearly a mandate that we should be hungering and thirsting, just as a deer panted for the water. So my soul longeth after thee. Blessed are those full of life, joy, and, <laughs> and enviableness are those who hunger and thirst after righteousness. They shall be filled. That, that, that promise is for real, but you have to do it according to God's plan and purpose. It has to be spirit, not soulish. Now, in, when uh, we eat our meals, the food enters into us and it becomes who we are. It becomes part of us. All right? uh, we digest, it becomes our inward element. That's a good way to look at it. When we digest it, it becomes our inward element. And we pray and spend time with the Lord. He becomes part of us. More so, we are being transformed. He gives himself to us as life, our food, our strength, our security, our living water, and our delight. All of those scripture proclaim how precious, O oh God, for the children of men that trust under the shadow of your wings. You, they are abundantly satisfied with the fullness of your house, and you give them drink from the river of your delight. For with you is the fountain of life. So Jesus not only, we're, we're going to get into my favorite part pretty soon, but I've got to lay this foundation first, because otherwise you'll, do it, you'll try to do it in your head, and you'll, you'll miss the point. All right. So he, he not only dispenses life into us, as he enters into us, he becomes our very life. So remember, we're talking about life joy. He enters in and becomes our life. That's in the Greek, that would be Zoe life, the God kind of life, not biological life. Animals have biological life. This is Zoe life. He wants to come into us and, and be our very life. Day by day, moment by moment. Now, that's what we're challenging for the end of uh, August on the Peace Challenge. Mm -hmm. Dual awareness, all right? Dual awareness is be conscious of what's going on in your spirit regardless of what thoughts are going through your head and what your circumstances are. And learn to walk in both at the same time. Now, a lot of people, that, when they've learned our material and they've learned how to deal with issues in their life, they say, oh, I got to drop down. The goal here is stay down. This is the leading way to abide. Abide means you stay there. So, but you've got to practice somewhere because you won't. You'll be like, when I, when I uh, discipled Jennifer, she was like a yo-yo. And it was like, all of a sudden she'd go, okay, I'm there. And then all of a sudden, without her saying a word, the car filled with tension. And I go, Jennifer, what are you thinking? Because you just went from I'm there to... I'm just wondering how we're getting all the furniture. We're going to stumble. We're going to, we're supposed to go to Connecticut. We're going to move over there. I'm going to... I go, That's exactly what you're emanating in the atmosphere, even without words. You emanate. You can fool people with your words. You can fool them with your gestures, but you cannot hide what you emanate. Someone's going to know that something's wrong. <laughs> now, <clears throat> so what we had to do with Jennifer, right, was... Practice get kitting the bucket down in those circumstances that are pulling you away this way and that way, and thoughts and circumstances that are pulling you uh, left and right. Learn to get to the presence of God, 
get your peace, and then say, I want to sever that cord. I want to stay down. Even like the children did with our children's books. We're in God country now. I want to stay there. That really needs to be the battle cry for the adults. I'm in God country now. I want to stay there. Help me, Jesus. All right? So as he enters into us, he becomes our very life. And day by day, moment by moment, he is our life. We can enjoy him every day. But we're, if you're going to enjoy him, you have to go to him. He's not up here. You go to him. And we can taste every moment. He's in the air, the spirit that we breathe. I love that song. It was a Michael, Michael W. Smith did that song. He is the air I breathe. Mm. And that's true because the breath of life is the spirit. And it's been like that from the very beginning. Day of Pentecost, that breath came down. Before that, he breathed into his disciples. But he breathed into us the breath of, of being a living being. In both the Old and New Testament, wind, breath, and spirit uh, are used as the same word. Wind, breath, and spirit. So we need to think in spiritual terms, not just natural life. Um, God is spirit and will always be available for our enjoyment. Now, we enjoy God through our spirit. Now, here's the part that I've been wanting to get to. I couldn't wait to preach this on Sunday. So I'm going to go slow. Don't fall asleep. This is important. How can God become part of our being? How can we enjoy God in our daily living? And you're going to remember this for years to come. Sometimes everything we've taught for years, you find another way of saying the same thing, and it seems like it's beneficial. It's like different translations of the Bible. You, you can have it memorized in King James and all of a sudden see it in another translation and it can enhance your relationship. It can add meaning to it. Even the paraphrases and all of those um, have that potential. So we know God and enjoy Him in our day. We know Him through our spirit, point one. We know Him through the spirit. And God created man with a spirit. Animals have a soul. They have a mind, will, and emotions. They do not have a spirit. All right, they have a mind, will, and emotion, a soulish nature. Humans were given a soul, a spirit, so that they could know God and have a relationship with Him. We know God through the Spirit. God is spirit, and those who worship Him, listen to this, must worship Him in spirit and truth. And reality can be transposed to where you see the word truth. We were meant to worship Him in the spirit and in reality. Our spirit is the organ we were given to encounter God. Here's where I'm going to go slow. And if you're a note taker, I suggest you take good notes on this. Our spirit is the organ we were given to encounter God. Memorize it. You say, well, I already know that. Memorize it. Because God created us with a stomach to receive and enjoy food we eat. So there is an organ for the food we eat. In the spirit, that is the organ to encounter God. It's not going to change. He's not confused. You might be, but he's not confused. Now listen to this. The spirit within us is for receiving and enjoying God, or using the word that really needs to be brought to the surface again, substance. So my spirit... Within is for receiving and enjoying God, substance. Now, our eyes, your physical eyes, are there to see the world around you. Our ears are the organ we use to hear voice and sounds. This is not complicated, is it? We can't hear voices with our eyes. It sounds like it's almost a kindergarten, but I think it's necessary. Huh? You can't hear voices with your eyes. Someone wants to show you a beautiful red uh, sailboat. 
but you can't see the sailboat with your ears. No matter how hard you try. It doesn't mean the sailboat's not there. It just means you're using the wrong organ to find it. You will not find the substance that's necessary because you're using the wrong organ. You can't hear with your eyes and you can't see with your ears. And you really need to see that voices I can't hear anything. I'm trying with my eyes, but I don't hear anything. Our mind is the organ for thinking thoughts. I can't find God with my mind. It's the wrong organ. Oh, the people that have spent their entire life learning God in their head. You got knowledge, but it's the wrong organ. You're missing reality, God initiative, and God provision. Reality or truth is substance. You can't, with your mind, substantiate God, spirit. You substantiate the substance of God's spirit with your spirit. When I speak, I exercise my voice. When I look at the world around me, I exercise my eyes. When others listen to me or, or they speak, uh, they exercise their ears. When I contact God and enjoy Him, I must exercise my spirit. And when we travel, we were shocked at how many Christians don't even know the location of the door of the heart and the innermost being, the gut, the belly, the bowels, out of my belly, gut, the expanded Bible, belly, gut, flows the rivers of life. There's no rivers of life flowing unless you've already drank. You can't feed the flock until you have feasted on Jesus. You have nothing to give that you haven't received. You can't give something you haven't received. You can give a lot of theory. You can give a lot of head knowledge. But the reality is you have to have eaten, digested, has it become part of you, and then it can be expressed in prayer. It can be expressed in words and preaching. Then you're feeding because you've already eaten full. You have food from that relationship of reality, God initiative, and then it becomes part of you. Like when you eat food, it becomes part of you. Once it's become part of you, you can express it in various forms. You can emanate it even without words. So the organ for knowing God is our spirit. And I, I think that uh, we had this come up in one of our um, Tuesday nights too, but substance. That's a good word to explain it because substance is something. Faith is the substance. Faith is not a, a leap in the dark. Faith is not a big nothing. Faith is substance. That means that there's an inner assurance here that I have it, and I, don't, I haven't seen it come to pass yet, but I have a no-so in my knower, in my spirit. I can substantiate. Faith is substance. And I can substantiate it by my spirit, not by my head. Not by my ears, not by my eyes. I can substantiate it by my spirit. Does that help? I think, I think too often we're using the wrong organ. Primarily for Christians, it would be the head. And that's not where... We, see, the, the beautiful thing is, is if I'm trying to hear something with my eyes, which sounds silly, it doesn't mean it's not there. It just means I can't substantiate it by using that organ. I can't see it with my ears doesn't mean it's not there. God's saying, I'm there, and I'm not far from you. Oh, that you would grope, even <laughs> some scriptures use the word, grope, feel after me, and you will find me, though I'm not far away. It's your organ that you're using wrong. Quit using your head 
to grope after and find me. I'm in the reality of spirit to spirit, breath to breath, heart to heart. That's, that's the reality. Prayer is not mental but spiritual. Prayer is not a matter of mental concepts, preferences, opinions, or carnal desires. To pray, we should turn our spirit and pray according to inward feeling. Inward feeling is inner awareness, touching. You were, you were meant to feel after God and to find Him. You were meant to drop into your spirit and enjoy an inner feeling and then learn to abide there. You have to learn to stay there. Because, whoa, look, like Jennifer, was. she was like a yo-yo at first. She could drop down, but staying there, the least little thought, and she'd go, whoa, what am I going to do? What am I gonna... Jesus didn't go anywhere. But the more you do that, the farther away he gets. <laughs> and he didn't really go anywhere. Technically, he didn't go anywhere. You went far away. He's still there going, oh, well, I hope she comes back. We were having wonderful communion there for a while, but and then she got, she, she went over there, she went over there, right? So we can't see sunshine and shadows with our ears. It's a wrong organ. But it doesn't mean sunshine and shadows not there. You cannot substantiate unless you approach and provide the way God made provision for you. And I'm hoping the silliness of these examples of organ might help people draw closer to God into a greater intimacy with God. It has to be spirit to spirit. It has to be heart to heart. You were made that way. All that other struggle is because you went somewhere and you're trying with another organ to have intimacy with God. And in reality, you're just going to do your preferences, your likes, your dislikes. You're going to do what the independent self wants to do. So the feeling deep inside is the feeling of the spirit. And, you know, there's three kinds of feelings. And some people operate so much in their head, they don't even know how to differentiate between the three feelings. There's physical feeling, like when you get a headache or you feel something hurt your arm or physical feeling, there's emotional feeling that are uh, carnal, soulish feelings. And then there's spiritual feelings. The goal of a real relationship with Jesus is to get to the spiritual feeling, but you've got to encounter him the proper way. You've got to use the proper organ. You've got to use your spirit to encounter spirit. Or it's all just a bunch of reasoning which, by the way, you won't find him. Learning and learning, but never coming to a knowledge of the truth. What do you think that means? That's someone that's stuck that I can figure it out. And I will figure it out. And I'll apply myself to figure it out. All that overthinking usually just, just causes you to waste time. Prayer is not a matter of mental concepts, preferences, opinions, or carnal desires. The purpose of prayer is to contact God. And then if we go back to that message translation and use, use the word that, that God said, when we touch God in the, in the spirit, we're even encouraging people during the peace challenge, go from touching God to an embrace. In other words, quiet that flesh. Take, teach that flesh to be quieted enough that you can not only touch his presence, but be embraced by that presence. That's going to require you sitting still and expanding the time element that you're with him, honoring him instead of going somewhere because you're busy in your thought life or otherwise. Uh, what were the three? Marinate his initiation. That means his push. If you want something to come out of you that's anointed, it's got to come from the push of God, not your push. Not you trying, but rather you yielding to the push of God. And when God pushes, 
It's in his initiative. It will come to pass and it will provide every time, every time, every time. You have not because you ask not, or you ask and you don't receive because you ask the mist. You pushed out of your mental likes and dislikes. You pushed out of what you thought would be good. To get in the spirit of prayer, first get to him before you start praying. You can pray all kinds of prayers all you want, but you need to be in him before you feel the initiative and the initiative that will bring provision every time. Your prayers aren't bringing provision every time. It's probably because they started with you. They didn't start with a God initiative. What was it the word that we were talking about that if we would look at it from a eating and drinking point of view, it would be when we feed on the word of God, we start by getting immersed. As you're immersed, you begin to get marinated and saturated. What's that mean? It means that you not only touch him, but you're staying there. And as you begin to marinate or get saturated, it's like food becomes part of you. It becomes part of you. As it becomes part of you, there is uh, clearly now uh, a displacement that's taking place. And the greater one in you is displacing your flesh. And as you learn to practice this, your flesh gets less and less empowered and your spirit more greatly empowered. And you advance. You advance. We're going to see how, how does this work. We're going to, we're going to get to that part here. Um, <clears throat> he, it's, it's possible to pray many requests with your mind uh, without touching God. All right. So this spiritual eating and drinking, uh, the first refer refer reference in relationship with man and God in the Bible presents himself to man as food. This shows that God wants man to enjoy him. After God created man, he planted them in front of the tree of life so that man could enjoy the fruit of that tree. God's first thought after creating man was for man to eat and to drink. I don't think we've, we've talked much like this in the church. We probably need to more likely because he was the word. The word was made flesh and he dwelt among us. Jeremiah, your word was found and I did eat and it was unto me the joy and the rejoicing in your heart. That's when you found the scripture. You didn't find the scripture by reading and thinking. You found it by drinking and feeding. Your word was found and I did eat and it was unto me the joy and the rejoicing of what? My heart, my spirit. So something was entertained down here until it not only uh, it not only saturated in it and enjoyed it, but it became part of you. And it produced a life joy. Now we're back to that scripture in the Amplified Bible. Blessed, happy, blithesome are those filled with life joy that is enviable. This is how to get it. How do you get life joy? You ask God for it in heaven with your head? That isn't going to work. Now, this is kind of hard, but this will break, it's a mess with some people's religion, but people usually think God wants religious worship and to be served. Uh-oh. However, God presents himself to us as food for our satisfaction. He presents himself as for our enjoyment. And for the bread of life, he comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. He that comes to me shall never hunger. And he will believe. See, God wants a mingled spirit. God wants a, we, we say, they that are joined to the Lord are one spirit with him. He wants the one spirit with him is what's honored. Not you doing for God. Not you serving God. Not you earning with dead works favor. There isn't anything in your flesh you can offer God that he wants. He wants the reality that you've experienced from him first. Then you give it to him as a form of worship. That's God honoring. 
You know, it's like the, the fruit on a tree. The fruit, for one thing, doesn't eat itself. But the fruit that bears, were the branches, and were to bear fruit as branches, the branch didn't produce the fruit. The vine produced the fruit. The branch is merely the vessel that allowed the fruit to be manifest. That's what God's looking for. You're not branches in and of yourself doing whatever you want to do and thinking it's fruit. Now, if I am the bread of life and he who comes to me shall never hunger and he who believes in me shall never thirst, then Jesus did not say he wanted us to do this or that for him. He said he wanted us to receive him and enjoy him. And like the tree of life that was in the garden, I've been placed before you in the tree of life so that you can stretch forth your hands in faith to receive me. I want to dispense myself with you. This is that confusing portion of scripture where it says, work out your salvation. Well, that sounds like I got to go do something. Work out your salvation for it is God who is at work in you to will and to perform. If he's not in you willing and performing, then you're doing it on your own. I thought some, many of my friends that got converted in the, in, the, in the 70s during the Jesus movement, I saw a lot of them burn out trying to please God. But it wasn't in the spirit, it was in works. And then man put the pressure on them to do more works <laughs> until they got more tired and quit. I can't do this, they said. But God's saying, I want you to receive me like the tree of life. I have been planted before you in the tree of life. So you can stretch forth your hand in faith and receive me. I want to dispense myself into you. See, serving God is really we. The mingled spirit joined to the Lord, your one spirit, the new creation reality is a spirit that is joined to God. You can function in the flesh apart from God. That does not please God. That independent self has all kinds of ideas on how to do good things for God. And as a young pastor, I think the most frustrating thing for me was at a church of about 250 people, and they're all mostly new converts, and the new converts always were saying, I feel lead. There was times I felt like getting a, a ball of lead and putting it on the pulp and saying, here, come here, feel this, because you're in the flesh. What you feel lead is nothing more than you want to do what you want to do. It, it got so common, I thought I was going to lose my mind. I'm going, I, could, I know that I know that I know that they're wrong, but I can't keep telling people they're wrong because they feel lead. <laughs> Come on up here and feel the lead. <laughs> there a big cannonball up at the pulpit so you can feel lead. It's self wanting what it wants. That is not God initiative. That is not the prompting or the push that's coming from God. You need to, but you can learn that differences very easily. I had, a, I was a hyperactive, filled with the Spirit, had revelation visions. But God forbid I would be in these little meetings with the pastor and he would say something. I'd raise my hand. I had something to say. I, I felt led. And nine times out of ten, it was over exuberance on my part. I was not led. And how did I know? It's because after I, sh they said, Dennis, what is it? And after I shared it in here, it would go thud. And I think, I think that was out of time. But it took me a lot of out of times before I realized I was out of time, <laughs> out of sequence. I was not being impulse. I was, had an excitement, and I couldn't tell the difference between excitement and motivation from the spirit. And I wonder how many people backslid because they were excited and got it put down. You know, we're not all wonderful with correction, you know. <laughs> <laughs> I'll never, I'll do like Jennifer did uh, when uh, her first marriage. It was was difficult. It was a right. He was abusive. She just copped eventually to protect herself. It's better not to talk. I would rather say talk, but pay attention down here as to who's prompting it, me or 
an excitement or an anointing. There's a big difference. One flows freely from the love of God. And learning that distinction is better than just saying, well, then I'll never say nothing again, ever. I wonder how many people backslid simply because they were in the process of learning but failed to understand that when you fail doesn't make you a failure. You fail, you get back up and learn from it. I had to learn to shut up in those meetings. And I found out that a lot of times when I did that, the prompting would come and it would be, it would be more anointing and less excitement. I had to know the difference between lust and love. <laughs> huh? Because they can both feel good. <laughs> so God's going to teach us the difference. But the process of life passing through the branches is enjoyment. That's how we bear fruit. Um, although the branches of the fruit-bearing tree, they, they bear much fruit, none of the fruit is the result of the work of the branches. So we got, got to quit patting ourselves on the shoulder like we did it. If it's of any spiritual value, you didn't do it. You cooperated, but you didn't do it. You cooperated. You were the channel or the, the uh, uh, ability to allow that life to flow from the vine through you to bear fruit. The branches simply absorb the sap, the riches of the tree, and the fruit grows. The branches only enjoy. They don't work. Uh-oh. Uh-oh. The branches don't work at it. Well, I, I'm going to work out my salvation. For it is, the very next verse, for it is God who is at work in you both to will and to perform. Ugh. The branches only enjoy. They don't work. They don't contribute anything. They don't perform any work. Oh, Wow. What a disappointment that is. Here, I wanted to get merit badges and stuff. And they, they, they just told me, stay attached to the vine. Drop down, stay there. Oh, that doesn't sound, that doesn't sound like I'll get much notoriety. I'll be pleasing God. Oh, maybe that's what I was supposed to do in the first place. Oh. Stay attached to the vine. Abide. John 15 is going to become a reality. We're going to learn to abide. Get, but it's progressive. But how do we learn progressive until we've, we've learned this is the right way, this is the wrong way. Let's get better at it and stay. Not just drop down when there's an issue. Let's learn to stay there and, and walk in an abiding relationship. The branches are only channels through which the sap flows. And we're told to abide. This process of life passing through the branches is an enjoyment. This is the Christian life. We abide by enjoying God. Does that maybe explain a little bit why we don't see more in the church of life joy, blithesome, life joy, makarios, life joy that is enviable, that everybody wants it? Maybe they, we haven't seen enough of it. And maybe we're applying the wrong organ to find it. Oh, God's desire is to join himself with man's spirit. God does not require religious observances from man in the flesh. But through the ages, God has wanted to be joined to man. I think Jason just got that scripture not too long ago. Trust in, um, cast all your care upon the Lord. But the part that stood out was because he cares for you. We could skip that very easily, couldn't we? Cast all your care upon the Lord, and you're just getting rid of all the junk that you've been burdened with all day and all week. Uh, just cast it. Because he cares for you. We missed the point that God wanted a relationship with us so bad that he humbled himself and became like us, even to the point of death on a cross. He became both divine and human at the same time, the incarnation. And it was through that that he wanted a relationship with man. He wanted to mingle with man's spirit. He who is joined to the Lord, one spirit with him. He wants to be part of us with him. God wants to mingle himself. He wants to enter us to be our content. There's the wise and the foolish virgins. Okay. He wants to be our content. I want to make sure we got plenty of oil. <laughs> Plenty of, uh, of the presence of God. 
We enter in to us to be part. We are vessels, containers. We were designed to be filled with God. He wants us to be our life and our nature. I always thought that was interesting. That it was never mentioned a lot. But in my name, you shall do this and you shall do that. In the name of Jesus, nature, in my nature. Are you in his nature or are you just using his name like a name dropper? <laughs> Are you a name dropper or are you in the nature of that name? <clears throat> no. Uh, he wants us to become part of us. He wants us to enter. He wants us to be our life and our nature. He wants to be the love in our emotions, the thoughts in our mind, and the decisions and impulses of our will. If you look at the weapons of our warfare, not carnal, but mighty through God that are pulling down the strongholds. If you look at it in the message, it says we have these God tools that bring every loose thought, emotion, and impulse into a life shaped by Jesus. And these tools are ready in that hand. In other words, they're available, but it's down here that they're available. If you don't use them down here, you use some other tool, don't be surprised if you can't substantiate it. No. God's saying that he wants us to love through our emotions. But whose love is it? We love because he first loved us. It's got to be his love. It's not your human love. So we're going to learn to enjoy God in times of prayer. We're going to learn how to uh, absorb the Word of God in day-to-day -day life. Not just read for content or doctrine but for st and studying at other times. That's good. But we should drink in and absorb the anointing through our spirit. Learn how to drink instead of just think. Feed instead of just read. And all of that is possible if you slow down. You can still do the other things. But walking in the Spirit is not just dropping down, but staying down. Jennifer put that in my notes. All right. Now, I'm going to cover four principles that I want you to write down. Four principles. In the next five minutes, we're going to cover four principles. Four steps to enjoy God. And you can see if you're faltering in any one of these steps. The first step is exercising our spirit. And that is turning inward according to inward feeling of your spirit. That's delighting yourself in the Lord. He'll give you the desires of your heart. That's uh, marinating in the reality. The second step is applying the principles of what we would call scripturally the incarnation. And God desires was to enter man and become mingled with man. Second point, God's desire is to be mingled with you, but if he mingles with you, how's he going to do it? What, what organ do you use for that? Spirit. There's no... All right? That's the second principle. And he didn't want one-sided praise. He doesn't want someone who's independent of God saying, I praise you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. I worship you, Jesus. And he's saying, you don't know me. You're just doing one-sided praise. You don't know me. Now, that I might know him, that I might progressively become more intimately acquainted with all the wonders of his person. That should be the motivation. Now, so the first step is exercising our spirit, making sure we're using the right organ. The second step is applying the principle that God wants us incarn The incarnation is the joined spirit. He doesn't want one-sided relationship. He was a God mingled with humanity, and he demonstrated that for us to show us how important that is. Through the incarnation, God's nature can be combined with our human nature. He wants to contact us, combine his divine nature with our human nature, and express himself through us. The third point, understanding, and this church has done this quite well, understanding the blood and the death of the cross. 
This, this step of the blood deals with sin. What do we do? We receive forgiveness and the blood cleanses us from all unrighteousness. So the third step is understanding that we need to deal with sin through forgiveness and learn to cooperate with that mingled spirit. We have two problems, sin and self. And what we've really addressed a lot of this is not blatant sin. What we've addressed is you're using the wrong <laughs> organ. That's self. So there's not only forgiveness for the sin, but there is a need to get the or use the proper organ in your relationship with God that deals with self. So sin and self is the third aspect that we need to deal with. To exercise our spirit, God wants us to cooperate with that being mingled together with him. And the fourth, the fourth step is the spirit of resurrection or the Zoe life or the life joy that's enviable. Once you've been mingled with the, with the Spirit of God, you're walking a forgiveness lifestyle, you're checking yourself for whenever self wants to go do its own thing, and you come back to Him, which He never leaves. <laughs> it means I left, I'm coming back, and dealing with that self, then you begin to learn to live with the Zoe, the God kind of life. The Zoe kind of life, the life joy that is enviable. So, Father, we just thank you for the incarnation that God is desiring to be in man. And for that resurrection, he brought man into God. Isn't that wonderful? He brought us into him. He wanted to get into us to the degree we allow him, we get into God. And then we release the essence of his nature because it is a we that's doing it. It is God who is at work to both will and to perform. Whose will? God initiative. Who's performing? God's anointing. Through what vessel? Not independent of us, but through us. And that's his joy. And when God's teaching us even on the unity that we have here, and we see it on Tuesdays, in the unity, what it is. There's a joy that if, when you're properly connected to God and you have love one for another, there is a, an excitement about seeing one another. There is an inner joy, a fellowship. Doesn't he say that in Philippians? If there's any joy in the fellowship, if there is any one accord, if there's any like-mindedness at all, Fulfill my joy, because that was his joy, even as a leader, to see that take place beyond an individual. To see a corporate expression, or the cluster, where the blessing is, and how beautiful and pleasant it is for the, for the oil to flow down like Aaron's beard. Blessed for the brethren dwell together in unity. That's the place of the commanded blessing. And we thank you for this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you for joining us. You've been listening to Drs. Dennis Clark and Jennifer Clark from Full Stature Ministries. To explore more life-transforming resources and deepen your faith journey, please visit us at forgive123.com and our online school at teamembassy.com. All rights reserved under applicable law. For details, please see our copyright policy on our website. Again, that's forgive. 123.com